Welcome back for part two of my chat with Sam Shepard, resident sports nutritionist and researcher nerd all the way from the UK, where part one we dove into carbohydrate oxidation and how it applies to you specifically as a triathlete. And today in part two, we're going to dive a little bit deeper down the fat oxidation and fat ap- fat adaptation rabbit holes. So thank you for coming back, Sam. Thanks for having me. Long time no see, mate. (laughs) I know, it's been a while. (laughs) At least a couple of minutes. So you could have changed. You could have got a different shirt. I didn't either. It's fine. (laughs) I've only got about five of these, so this is all I wear. Yeah. Funny. So let's dive straight in then. We we finished off our first conversation talking about, you know, whether triathletes should dabble in a fat-adapted strategy or play with low-carb, high-fat. But what actually does fat adaptation mean? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So, I mean, I suppose theoretically it's just when the body uses fat as the main fuel rather than carbohydrate. That's, if you like, some level of the definition. I mean, we can dig into that a little bit more if we want to enter kind of a, and I suppose this is ultimately the aim when we're we're trying to be fat adapted. Um, Part of that is to enter this state of ketosis or polyketosis so always be in this sort of state of ketosis and we define that as having um, ketone levels sort of higher than 0.5 millimoles per liter in the blood so that's probably yeah two ways in which you could define fat adapted um and i think we'll kind of come on to this but for me if you are fat adapted then you are able to use fat as a fuel at the appropriate time i would add as a, as a caveat or an extra point to that after that first point because using fat all the time might not be um, sufficient for what we are aiming to do as an athlete if we're aiming to do high work you know high intensity work for example yeah so is that the concept of metabolic flexibility that is really sexy at the moment is being able to draw <laughs> on that yeah essentially yeah so metabolic flexibility really is that idea that you can switch between the fuels that you're using relative to the intensity of exercise that you're doing um nutritional changes and do that without i suppose ultimately harming performance which is probably the again that caveat that we want to add to that point yeah so why why then are triathletes a little bit obsessed with doing this i i had to think about this from a, a practical perspective and again watching kona at the weekend was probably quite a good example a few good examples there one being that if you lose a bottle early on on the bike that's got all your nutrition in or a large part part of your nutrition in then if you aren't metabolically flexible and able to maybe dial back the intensity of the ride that you're doing slightly but still maintain a a relatively high output um then you're a bit too carbohydrate dependent and you're not your body's not able to then go actually we're not getting the carbs we need here to to sustain this intensity maybe we need to switch to using a little bit more fat. And if you can do that efficiently without harming performance and and output, then that's the ideal scenario, really, um, being able to switch between those fuels. If you are very highly dependent on carbohydrate as a fuel and highly dependent on having exogenous, as we kind of talked about in first, so the carbohydrate that we ingest, um, if your body's not getting that, and it just starts to go, oh, hang on, and panic, and you, you know, you're, you're overstressed, let's say, and it doesn't switch to fat as a fuel effectively, then that will start to decrease your level of performance. So, you know, your your bike power will go down, your running speed will go down quite quickly. So we're trying to avoid that scenario where we're not overly dependent, probably, on carbohydrates as a fuel, um, but we recognize that it's an important fuel that we're going to need, need to use at appropriate times, and, and the rest of the time we can rely on fat as the dominant fuel source, essentially. And then how do you how do you do that? Everyone listening is like, that sounds wicked. Now, how do I then do that? <laughs> Teach yeah, me so the ways. That's, again, <laughs> again, the million dollar question. And oh, sorry. I suppose <laughs> that's ultimately the aim, isn't it, of, of of what we're trying to do? That we want to ultimately have the highest fat oxidative capacity available to us. Um, and we kind of touched on in the fir- first time we spoke about 0.5 grams per minute of fat being, you know, a good uh, or sort of average number for someone who's recreationally or somewhat well-trained I mean, in terms of fat oxidation or, ma- or fat max. 
ideally, you know, we push that up to closer to one or maybe even beyond that 1.2 grams per minute. Um, and then you're getting a greater proportion of your energy from fat at the same intensity or same power or speed um, that we're running at or, or cycling at, something like that. Um, so that's great. But if we go a little bit too far with that, then we will suppress our ability to use carbohydrates as a fuel, which we know is really important when we come to do the higher intensity stuff that, that's ultimately, um, you know, relies on carbohydrate as the, as the energy to, to, to enable us to do that. It's a scenario really where you want the best of both worlds. You want the highest mm -hmm. available fat oxidative capacity without harming your ability to use carbohydrate as a fuel which sounds yeah. amazing and it's not an easy place to get to of course you know we can look at a number of factors that will influence that the main one is ultimately our sort of zone two or time in zone two so you know there's been a lot of talk in the in cycling and particularly we look back at like uh, Pagacha, he talks a lot about the zone two training and that's incredibly important because that will as a result of doing that type of exercise and that, that intensity where we're using fat as the dominant fuel source, our body will adapt to that over time. And the more we do of that, then the greater adaptation that will occur. And that will also drive up our fat oxidation capacity. Now, that's great if you've got all the time in the world to do that type of training yeah. and you're able yeah. to do 30 hours a week. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, many of us don't. And so we might be down at maybe 10 hours a week. So that's where we might start to introduce things like faster training it might be one approach that we might consider with the caveat being that we need to make sure that we refuel appropriately afterwards. I would always say that. Um, we can also think about, and, and this is probably the, the sexy thing in the moment, but is like periodizing our carbohydrate intake around the training that, we've, that we're doing. So again, back when I was at, working at Liverpool John Moores University, so I was lucky enough to work with James Morton, who's one of the kind of world leaders in this area alongside Louise Berg. Um, and he coined the phrase like the fuel for the work requires. And that's essentially what it is. It's, you know, you're giving yourself uh, carbohydrate at the appropriate times. So for the harder sessions, so that might be before, during and after in terms of refueling. And then the rest of the time, we can try to push our body to use fat as a fuel so, for example, you know, if I've gone out for an easy hour run this morning, I would probably get up and do that fasted. Um, I know I can run fairly easy for an hour. I'd make sure I didn't spike, you know, didn't suddenly start sprinting up a hill or something like that. That I gained, so I take it easy and go up that nice and easy. So fat yep. is the dominant source of energy, and not only is it I'm burning fat through that session, which is which is great, but as a result of that, my body will adapt to to do that more effectively after several weeks of doing that type of training equally you know i might have a threshold session to do tomorrow morning in fact i have got a threshold session to do tomorrow morning. it's just reminded me <laughs> i'm clearly you know that's clearly going to be carbohydrate dependence tonight for dinner it might be that i would increase my carbohydrate content in in my dinner and then certainly in the morning even if i get up and get on the bike before having had any food or any fuel, I will definitely start fueling that session almost by the end of the warm up um, and into that session. So I will be giving my body carbohydrate to support the execution of a quality session there. And that really is the fundamentals of this fuel from the work, fuel for the work requires sort of concepts is that, yeah, you're giving the body or asking the body to use the correct fuel at the correct time relative to the session that you're trying to do. And we think that that's the best way to, and, uh, and it makes sense really to encourage your body to be metabolically flexible and, and adapt in that way because ultimately you're saying, right, use carbohydrate when this is hard and use fat when it's easy at the very basic level. That's what we're trying to teach ourselves to do. Yeah, it is. I don't know. I feel like that is one of the biggest rocks for triathlon nutrition is understanding how to do periodization because I it's like it's hard. Like in practice, it's hard. In theory, it's hard. And it is something that I work with my athletes to do, but it is a long, long game. It's not something that can click for somebody in a couple of short days. Like, yes, yes, you can, you know, 
eat better for those bigger, harder, heavier days and eat differently for lighter days. But then the actual practice of implementing that as a busy age group triathlete who works and, you know, has to do all this training in a week, it is, yeah, one of the hardest things in practice I find to to maintain and get right. Do you know or are you across any of the female research in this space? Because there's some, a few loud, noisy voices that reach us in Australia about females should never do faster training. Uh, it drives me up the wall a little bit, but are you across any of that female research? Not in detail. My partner actually is, so I should get, get you to speak to her. Get her on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, she does a lot of work in that area. My, If I'm working with an individual, then I would look at their life. It goes back to their lifestyle, really, I think. Yes, there's some noise about this idea of females not doing faster training. I don't necessarily agree because it ultimately it's got to fit into their lifestyle. So if their only opportunity to train is in the mornings, before the kids are up or before they go to work i would much rather they do that training and we adjust what that training looks like to enable them to do it rather than having to get up two hours early thinking i need to eat before i do this session or foregoing the session completely and because they're not going to fit it in at another time in the day so we've kind of got to weigh up what we're actually trying to achieve a lot of the time um mm. and take a, a sort of yeah take that approach with it you know also thinking about is there periods of of life which are stressful or is it a busy week at work or you know if you've and again it i'm not saying that it all falls on on the female to look after the kids but that's often the setup if you like for most families or if their husband's in london at the moment then it becomes you know you're the person looking after them i have not done any <laughs> and, training all week thank yeah, you for highlighting yes. that <laughs> Sorry about that, but there's an extra, you know, there's an extra level of stress, an extra burden there, and under those uh, scenarios, maybe yeah, faster training might not be appropriate when you're already under a certain level of stress anyway. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a, a sort of surface level answer, but I think it goes back to understanding the individual that we're working with, yeah. and what yeah. it is that they're trying to achieve and what their aims are and what their life looks like at that moment in time as well to then make that decision about okay how are we going to get you to do the training um, and support the tr you know support that alongside having a healthy lifestyle as well yeah amen amen so we talked about in part one the influence of your day-to-day -day diet and nutrition on your ability to oxidize fat and carbohydrate is there any other particular dietary strategies other than faster training that we can lean on to enhance our fat oxidation pathways? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it is mainly dietary. Uh, we, we spoke about that study in the first uh, first time we spoke, um, which showed that that was one of the key determinants of faster training. We can also, you know, talk about this idea of glycogen depleted training or carbohydrate restricted training um, as well might be another way to uh, increase your uh, fat oxidation capacity we obviously have to implement that very carefully alongside yeah. for most people maintaining energy balance and um, so yeah. it comes back to that periodization of carbohydrate as well to to try and support that but those are the main things you know that we can go to a supermarket or look online and there's certain supplements that claim to be you know increase our ability to burn fat probably l-carnitine is is one of the ones that we would look at back you know there's a, a nice study from paul greenhalf and Ben Wall was the first author back in 2011. That was probably one of the first studies that did this like, really well um, to show that if you supplement with carnitine um, for six months, and this was in uh, people doing it for six months, so they had carnitine twice a day, then they could increase their ability to use um, fat slightly as a fuel um, at lower intensity exercise, but it didn't actually harm their ability to do higher intensity work either so that's maybe the trade-off that we're looking for but the relative change using carnitine is always going to be much much smaller than what we might achieve with dietary periodization of carbohydrates as well so yes it's significant yeah. and it looks great but is it meaningful um in the grand you know in, in the grand scheme of things for, for people and it, again it comes back to the dietary strategies really which will promote that 
metabolic flexibility that we're looking for. And you just gave us two strategies that I don't want anyone to try unless you have sports dietitian input. <laughs> Triathletes love to add to cart and <laughs> oh, there are so many things that you need to get right and get guidance on if you're looking at implementing both of those things, okay? Top top of the pyramid type strategies there. Absolutely, yeah. Are there any, are there any specific scenarios or races or particular people that are going to benefit from doing some fat oxidation, fat adaptation type strategies in their training program or life? I would say any endurance athlete is probably uh, <laughs> an endur and anyone who has ambitions to do an endurance event is going to benefit from implementing some strategies in their life. The easiest one is fat faster training, but really I would still argue that that's somewhat periodized and it comes back to periodized carbohydrate intake as well. Um, yeah. We can look at we can look at professionals. If we go back to the professionals, and we said how important zone two training was, and that's the same for everyone. The professionals just have a lot more time to do that, but they will also undertake a lot of sessions with low carbohydrate, not necessarily through design, but mainly through the number of hours that they're doing mm. in a week or a day. So, you know, they might be trying to fit three sessions in in a day they're going to struggle to complete all of those sessions with high carbohydrate stores just yeah. because they're not going to be able to refuel appropriately and quickly enough after you know one session and then then another so naturally they will be doing some yeah. lower carbohydrate or carbohydrate restricted training not by design but as an age group we can definitely do that by design and that may be where it holds um, a benefit for the time restricted athletes and age groupers to start to implement some of those strategies i think you're right it's very difficult to it's a difficult process to undertake and definitely you need to, uh, I always think, try and do that um, working with a sports nutritionist or, or dietitian because they will help not only implement that but help you understand why uh, as well. That's the one thing that I try and tackle the people that I work with is like, I can tell you exactly what to do, but I also want you to understand why you're doing it because yeah. if, a, if a session suddenly changes, and I'm not at the end of the phone to suddenly tell you, oh, no, you don't need to go and eat some carbs now or, or not, then you need to be able to react accordingly because our lives are a little bit unpredictable. Yeah, I think those are those are the main tips there. And, uh, and yeah, it goes back to ultimately what you're trying to achieve as an athlete as well and how much time you have to put into training, but then also into, yeah, you know, dietary strategies around your training as well i firmly believe there's a big payoff if you can incorporate the relevant dietary strategies that will promote your not only your fat oxidation but your metabolic flexibility as we can keep coming back to but it's not as sexy as a disc wheel or you know some snazzy carbon a carbon pair of shoes so you, you know the instagram post that people like to share after they purchase something isn't that sexy I periodized my carbohydrates successfully today. Um, but, but yeah. <laughs> like, I love it. I love it so much. I love that you teach your athletes why as well. It's one of the key things that I like to do with my athletes because, well, like I'm not on speed tile. And you will have a much better performance in training and racing if you have the ability to adapt to nutrition on the fly. You know, like life throws you curveballs constantly. Maybe you get sick, maybe you get injured, maybe you got a meeting thrown into your lunch break where you were going to do a run, like all these sorts of things will happen. The more you understand why you're doing something with your nutrition and then how to specifically do that for yourself is so much more valuable than being dictated a plan that you have no idea how it works or why it's set up that way and then how to change it if you know you end up not doing a training session or you do an extra training session. So I love that you work that way as well. It's so much more valuable and it kind of sets athletes up for success long term, not just a quick fix. Absolutely. I think um, alongside that, I think people can often get a bit disappointed if they don't, you know, follow something to the letter or... Um, Triathletes in particular. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the thing that I would always say to people, like, if you can get, you know, 80% of the week is good, then that's that's fine. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time. I know we're always looking for perfection, generally through the, you know, the personality types of people who do the, you know, endurance and, and triathlon in particular. But it doesn't have to be perfection and it can still be effective. 
Uh, and that's probably the other key point to stress there as well. Yeah. Yep. So what are what are the big rocks then for metabolic flexibility? Doing some, you know, faster training sometimes. Big rock is periodization and understanding how to, you know, fuel for the work required, but pulling on all those different levers to eat what you need on a daily basis that should change and evolve on a daily basis as your training evolves. Is there anything else that are big things to work towards the mecca, the golden metabolic flexibility i think those are the two key things and it's just remembering why as well we're trying to to have this flexibility yes it's a performance benefit but we can also think about it from a health perspective as well um again going back to those conditions like obesity and type 2 diabetes a lack of metabolic flexibility is often underpinning those um leading to those conditions so even outside of an athletic perspective, yes, we're all interested in performance and being as good as we can as an athlete, but really it goes back to like, let's think about this as a lifestyle as well. And mm. we're not going to be triathletes forever. I mean, arguably, you know, you see 75, Come on now. Uh, 75 year olds completing Kona and things, which is unbelievable. Yeah. So uh, absolutely incredible. But it's a very small age group, so there's clearly not that many people doing it. And, you know, we need to look beyond what we're doing as an athlete and think, yes, this is a lifestyle approach as well. And so th there's follow through there, you know, from an exercise perspective, it's great, but also from a dietary perspective, understanding that carbohydrate periodization and things like that can also follow through into making sure we are healthy outside of our athletic life as well. Yeah. You're like me, but the UK male version. I love it. We've never spoken before. And Sam's just busted out all the things that I try and like bang into people. And I love that. Yeah. We should hang out more, though the time zone's not particularly conducive to chatting on the regular basis. You can swear, you can say whatever you want. Can I ask you about ketones? So Sam, can I ask you about ketones? Because so many triathletes take them and they're expensive and they think it's doing things and i would love to get your perspective on ketones what do you reckon yeah big sigh um well the uh, first thing <laughs> is what i would say is these triathletes have got an unbelievable budget if they think that they can <laughs> use ketones regularly um they're getting paid much more than i am um so yeah Same. fair play uh, <laughs> um i think at the moment it's an interesting area if you've got the budget to use them, then fantastic. From what I understand, the research isn't so supportive. It seems to be more from a recovery tool than anything else at the moment. And that's why you see the likes of Ineos and uh, or Fismolita bike and people like that in the peloton, uh, these pro tour, pro tour cycling teams using them. Firstly, they've got the budget, which is great, but they're also trying to do multi-day events. They're trying to recover very quickly from training. Um, and that seems to be where and they're also research. elite athletes uh, yeah, and they're also they're elite like athletes. So they, the top yeah so there's maybe a necessity for those guys but I think for your average person and not even an average person you know, someone at the high, high end of an age group for example I still think there's more benefit from looking at your diet as a, as a start point and then you know other little things around that to support your training um which will have much more of a benefit to your performance than than taking ketones again it just it's just easy to to use ketones um mm. it's a little bit sexy you can put it on instagram that you've had your ketone shot as all the pros do but i think realistically trying to fit that into everything else that you're trying to do there's there's more benefit from a dietary perspective to support your training than, than you know, absolutely using the ketones, at least at the moment. And, and I think that's probably what the research is telling us as well, um, at the moment as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I know that that was like putting needles in your eyes answering that question, but I think that was a nice, well-rounded answer. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I, um, I listened to, and I can't recall the podcast now, but um, I listened to a podcast the other day and they talked a lot more around, you know, the ketones for cognitive function and mm. um, recovery from like traumatic brain injury and things like that. So there might well be a role for, for them in that space. It's not something that I'm across really. 
um, but particularly in you know contact sports, maybe there is a role for for uh, ketones there. But I think, yeah, in yeah, going back to the endurance world, I think there's more to be more benefits to be had from looking at day to day diet and, and supporting training appropriately. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. So looking ahead, like wh- where are we heading with fat oxidation and fat adaptation? Like what is emerging in the research? You've got your fingers on the poles and what sort of things should in particular age group triathletes be looking out for? Uh, I think we can, you know, that that message of we want to improve our fat oxidation to the highest capacity whilst not suppressing our ability to use carbohydrate when appropriate is still going to hold true. From a research perspective, it's worth saying that that idea of periodizing carbohydrate has only really been done in, um, as I recall, athletes up to around who are doing up to around 10 to 12 hours per week. So if we go a little bit higher than that, does it still need to be implemented? We talked a little bit about the professionals and just as a as a function of the training volume that they're doing and the number of sessions they're doing, they will naturally sort of be doing some sessions with restricted carbohydrate intake anyway so maybe there's a maybe there's a sweet spot where we can implement these periodized carbohydrate dietary strategies to support training it might be you know maybe it's 15 20 hours a week and then if you go beyond that it might not really need to be so important and so i think there's going to be some research in that area i think the other thing that's important and to consider at the moment is this idea of and it's kind of not related to fat, although it will have an impact on fat oxidation, is exogenous carbohydrate. And, you know, are we going to see people pushing this up even higher than, you know, 120 grams an hour? And probably also looking at, there's a little bit of research that's come out recently looking at this idea of how body weight might influence exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates. So if you are a bigger, I'd say, male athlete, and probably Magnus Ditlev is a really good example that I can think of from the weekend. He was reportedly having 180 grams of carbs an hour. Now, theoretically, when we go back to the research, theoretically that you know is completely over the top. Um, but maybe for him, he has a you know he's a bigger guy, therefore has a bigger you know guts essentially, um, you know longer intestines, things like that there's a greater capacity for absorption. So maybe it's appropriate for him to be able to do that compared to, you know, a 50 kilo, again, a female athlete who's much smaller. So maybe she requires a little less carbohydrate. It doesn't need to be quite so high. Uh, so I think there's going to be more work in that area over the next few years. There's a, there was a nice paper recently from Gareth Wallace and Javier Gonzalez over in the UK that started to address that. It was a quite a small study. Um, they didn't, they only fed glucose, so it wasn't a glucose fructose combination. So there's there's definitely work to to kind of do in that area and to understand that relationship. And that's useful, you know, for for us as age group athletes. We can say, okay, we're I'm 75 kilos, you know, maybe my optimum is 100 grams an hour. So you know, we can start to understand that and implement that from a from a practical perspective for people as well. Probably the other thing related to that is then again just looking at that. Um, ratio of glucose to fructose as well there's some some people starting to think that maybe even a one-to-one ratio might be beneficial there's not really any clear evidence to support that yet but um that may well materialize in the next few years so i think there's a few things there you mentioned it i think before as well uh taron the gut microbiome and what role that will play in you know our and again we can probably think about exogenous carbohydrate oxidation rates are our ability to absorb carbohydrates so understanding the gut microbiome what factors will influence the gut microbiome and then how that influences performance and what um impact that will have on our ability to perform or absorb carbohydrate at a very high rate that's probably going to be the yeah, some of the key areas and then the final one um which is probably a little bit contentious or maybe not contentious, not contentious, but despite, I think there's going to be a lot of effort and there is being a lot of effort made to understand the, or get to this point where we think there's going to be female specific nutrition guidelines. Yeah. And I'm not sure 
that's really going to be true. We might understand that there might be some differences between males and females or slight differences based on menstrual phase um, or pre, post, perimenopause, something like that. But really, and something we don't do very well in research is look at an, on an individual level. And ultimately, it's going to come down to individuals. And this is why you know the work you do is so important, working with individuals to understand them. And then you can work out what their needs are uh, on mm. an individual basis. Um, it's very easy to look at research and we, you know, adhere to the mean value um, mm. and assume everyone responds the same way. But there's so many factors that will influence these things that, um, yeah, yeah, I think I think that research is going to evolve and be important, but we still need to think about the individual when we come back to that. Yeah, I agree. You honestly are like the male version of me. <laughs> I don't see us having really detailed female specific guidelines because it is going to come down to the individual and I always say that to people because even the elite ultra marathon runners if you if you drilled down into that paper and had a look at the athletes that actually made it to the finish line of that run chewing through 120 grams of carbs an hour not many of them did it more than 50 percent bombed out with massive gut issues and things like that so yeah you're right yeah. individual always like i always say to my athletes n equals one like you are your own experiment and we have you know evidence-based scientific guidelines but it's about understanding what's going to work for you and having the ability to you know, troubleshoot and tweak and finesse things constantly is is super valuable, and you can only do that when you understand like why you're doing particular strategies and then how to manipulate them over time. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I suppose that's one thing we do, or we like to think we do quite well at Precision is, uh, and probably Leon Chevalier again, he came forth at, at Kona at the weekend. But we've got ten different, I think, at least ten different case studies from various races that he's done. And we can show how he's evolved his nutrition strategy over time. So the point I'm trying to make here is that these things are evolving and they will. there's always iterations and, and tweaks and changes that you make, you know, after every race. But having that capacity to reflect and refine what you're doing is really important. And that doesn't have to just be because you're a professional and you've maybe got some additional support to do that. We can do that mm -hmm. on an individual level. Yeah. As well. The other thing I think from what you said before may be coming is gels and sports drinks that have probiotics in them. I reckon that's that's like that's the next thing. You wait, you watch in like three years' time, there's going to be probiotics in all of our sports nutrition and sodium bicarb and creatine. Um, so I think L-carnitine. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of, <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have yeah maybe maybe we don't need to go down that route of all these different supplements being pushed in. But yeah, I mean it's probably another good one actually. There's more and more people in the endurance world using sodium bicarb, but also using creatine as well. Um, and the research years ago around that was largely based on like the high intensity work that people were doing the shorter stuff. But it seems to, probably for not entirely clear reasons for us at the moment, uh, it seems to have benefit um, when we translate or use that in, in an endurance environment as well, which is interesting. So I think that's going to continue to grow um, in the next few years. Okay, maybe we'll get you back on to talk about that in you know a year or two time when there's more research in that space. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Sam. It is so late here, but I am so excited after our deep chat on fat oxidation and fat adaptation and just getting nerdy on the disco muscle stuff. Like that is so cool. And it's really nice to and refreshing to talk to somebody that has a similar sort of ethos and methodology around working with athletes on their nutrition so that is super cool good luck in your new role at precision fuel and hydration and i'm sure i will be calling you soon to get some updates on the research that you guys are doing amazing thank you very much for having me taryn um yeah happy to come back on and chat more nerdy stuff in the future yeah thanks sam <laughs>